Hi there, and welcome to another video with a fabulous Rabbi Rage. And um, it's unusual for me to have someone back very quickly, but there were so many views and so many comments and so much we didn't discuss. I've asked her straight back. So hi, Rachel. How are you? Doing great. I'm glad to be back. How are you doing? Yeah, it's good. It's, it's one of the fascinating things for me, and I'm sure this has happened to you, is comments that don't believe you're a real person or you really did this. And, I, you know, I had some flat out comments saying, you, you can't reverse that condition. You can't. And uh, it's very frustrating. So for those, if, you, if you're going to do that comment, great, because the engagement goes up. It's fantastic. So <laughs> um, thanks for that. Uh, but for the 98.9% .9 of people who look at these videos and with an open mind think it's great, that's why we're here. Okay. So, um, Rachel, I'll open the questioning because... The big thing that stuck in my mind after the last interview was you mentioned so many other solutions other than carnivore, which is which is fine um, because I ground. I was thinking of all the things I do that I just do anyway. Morning yeah. sunlight, you know, I do it. So um, the brain training thing really, really interested me. So how did you get into that and what actually is it? Yeah, so... Honestly, I heard about brain retraining probably five years before I started it. And speaking of comments on that past video that we did, there was somebody that commented, I don't believe in brain retraining because this is a physical illness. And that comment is one that, you know, I get fairly often. And it's also where I used to be in a mindset of, well, that that doesn't sound like it can work because I have real illness. And it makes me so sad when people comment that because it's not what brain retraining means at all. The need for brain retraining and working on the nervous system does not suggest that your illness isn't real. It doesn't suggest that it isn't serious and it doesn't ex well, it doesn't suggest that it isn't a real physical illness. And so basically brain retraining is a concept where you know our our brains are plastic and they can change and so all sorts of different things wire our brain, either in a positive way or in a negative way. And so brain retraining is the idea that you are consistently signaling safety to your brain so that your nervous system can shift into a parasympathetic state where healing can actually start to take place. And so our nervous system has two main states, a parasympathetic state, and that's a state where we have rest, repair, and healing. And then we have the sympathetic sympathetic state, and that's kind of the fight or flight state, the survival state. And so usually when people are dealing with a chronic illness, their nervous system tends to get stuck in this chronic dysregulated state, in either a chronic state of fight or flight or freeze or shutdown, and the nervous system isn't working properly. And so brain retraining is something that we can do to rewire our brains to allow for healing and so the main idea with it is that we visualize ourselves healthy and strong and that visualization signals safety to the brain and the brain doesn't know the difference between visualization and reality and so it can be very powerful for healing. And it definitely has been for me. And after so many years of being told that I had lifelong chronic illnesses and genetic illnesses and healing wasn't possible for me, there's nothing I can do to heal. Like you don't want to believe it, but after a while it kind of, you know, it gets in your head. And so another aspect of, of brain retraining is is belief work and letting go of limiting beliefs and and allowing yourself to believe that you can heal and so it definitely involves a lot of different things and for me i started with a brain retraining program there are lots of brain retraining programs out there i personally started with a program called dnrs so that stands for the dynamic neural retraining system and it's interesting because when people hear brain retraining, they often think it's this like mysterious thing that, you know, is secret and you have to buy this program to figure it out. And really those programs are just a toolkit. It's just like a course. It, it helps you to get the tools that you need to heal. So I always like to tell people like, 
you can heal without a primary training program. You can figure it out on your own. You can learn how to rewire your brain on your own. But often those programs can be really helpful. And for me, it definitely was just having kind of a that toolkit and that guidance to help me to know where to start. Because this is a really foreign concept in our society, which is unfortunate because I think everybody is living with a degree of nervous system dysregulation because, you know, our society isn't conducive to having a healthy nervous system. And so for me, you know, rewiring my brain in combination with changing my diet was, you know, the most powerful thing. And I I think it's kind of cool because I, I changed my diet probably eight months before I started brain retraining. And I saw, you know, that improvement and then I implemented brain retraining and I saw a whole new layer of healing and improvement. And so it was cool that I didn't start them both at the same time and because then I would really know what progress I made from what. But um, I would definitely say that the, the brain retraining work I did brought quicker progress for my healing than changing my diet. And so it's been really impactful for me. And um, I think when brain retraining, usually what people think of is like a, a program that you do, but really at the core of brain retraining is like what you eat wires your brain, what you think about wires your brain, so many things like spending time on screens wires your brain social media wires your brain like all these things can wire your brain either in a positive way or a negative way and so um focusing on rewiring your brain in a positive way can be really impactful for you yeah and i think this thing about the mind and body connection not being a thing um there's a there's a few analogies i always give to people one is if you had to bet your life savings on somebody winning a race and it was two twins, it was standing in front of you and they were exactly the same from birth. They trained the same. They ate the same. And one twin said, I'm going to win this race for you. I, I, I just, I know it. I feel it in my bones. I'm going to win this race. And the other one said, oh, I just, I'm not, I'm not on it today. I'm really not on it. So you've got exactly the same physical situation, but you've got two completely different mindsets. Right. And I know, I know who you, Everybody would bet on. Uh, so that sort of proves that anyone that says there's no such thing as mind-body connection, that sort of disproves it. Um, and there's a couple of other things. I use a Shakti mat for my lower back pain, or I did use it, and I couldn't lie on it for more than a minute. And I didn't understand um, how people could fall asleep on it because I was trying it for the first time. I didn't have that plastic attitude. My neuroplasticity wasn't in place. This was a long time ago, by the way. Um, and within six weeks, I could lie on a Shakti mat, which is like a sort of acupressure, better nails, however you want to put it. And I would fall asleep. I would absolutely fall asleep. So your body is obviously adapted because it's the physical mat's the same. Your body is the same, but your perception of pain is the same. And, and pain is, is, is an abstract. It is a perception. It, you can't put a number on pain. You can try to. But when that perception slightly skewed, I mean, when I did my honours degree in the somatosensory part of the brain, there were there were there was a boy who could put his hand into fires because his perception of pain was not wired correctly. Now they rewired him through retraining. So I mean, that's happened. And the the final thing you meant you mentioned uh, flight or fight. Well, that's the stress response, you know, for, so if a tiger walked in now, you know, all the blood would leave my guts and go to my muscles and make me run away or fight the tiger if I was stupid enough to try that, probably would run. Um, well, if you're in a stressful situation all the time, this, you know, it work or you can't tell your boss to, you know, do one or whatever, um, and you, you have a stressful relationship your guts are going to turn over. You're not going to digest properly. You know, so there's, there are so many things that can be external, not physical, that can change the physical. I mean, there's too many examples. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's great. So that was a really good answer. And I think um, we will still get comments, but there you go. Uh, you also mentioned sort of somatic pra practices, you know, like body-centered uh, modalities to sort of like enhance your awareness, release tension. What, what, what was that about? Yeah, so I think this one is is often one of the most difficult things to explain, and I, I definitely wouldn't consider my 
myself an expert in this area, but somatic practices definitely have been helpful for me in my healing. And basically it's using the sensation of physical touch to bring your brain into the present. So often with nervous system dysregulation, we find ourselves either stuck in the past or worrying about the future. And so it's just kind of different practices that you can do. Like for me, one of my favorite things to do is something called the containment hug. So you just like put your uh, hand on your armpit and like this, and you're kind of giving yourself a hug and that signals safety to your brain and um, can kind of calm the nervous system. And there are lots of different uh, somatic practices that you can do. I, I've i just literally gone on YouTube and typed somatic practices and you can kind of do guided visualizations or guided uh, somatic practices. And Instagram has a lot of good uh, resources for this as well. And like I said, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on it, but I, I've found benefit from it. And I think it's, um, it's kind of a top down and a bottom up approach when it comes to nervous system regulation and somatic practices are, are more of a, a bottom up. So, so body to brain versus brain to body. Yeah, and the Alexander technique, I think, is the most sort of popular example of that, where you can move your body in certain ways. Um, I think that I think there's a lot to be said for that sort of thing. The self-hugging bit is is always interesting. I'm sure there's going to be a few people that try that. Now you've demonstrated it. But <laughs> hugging has a huge a huge role to play in um, how how you grow as an animal. I remember you know seeing some studies where. Um, horrible studies actually on animals, but you know, it, we learned something from it where uh, they bore this monkey up and it had choices between food and not even its mother. It was um, like a piece of metal that was slightly warm and it had a, a soft sort of fabric around it and it could either hug that or go and get food. And it see, chokes me a bit because I saw the video of it and it was, it was desperate for hugs, it was desperate for attention over food which I thought was incredible. So um, we need to be open-minded, which brings us into the, the next realm. This really is a whistle stop, but I think, you know, people can pick up on it and maybe we could do a third one. But anyway, letting go of limiting beliefs. Ooh, so, yeah. Um, I think my life's been that. Before you give your answer, my life was high carb, calories in, calories out, skim milk, blueberries, all those sort of things, but other things as well, sort of social economic beliefs, political beliefs, um, how we operate as humans, you know, the good in people, everything, all my beliefs since I was 50, so that was 10 years ago, have been completely 180. Uh, so many of my beliefs that limited a lot of what I did and also my um, physical performance and everything absolutely i i had to let go of a lot of beliefs and it's very difficult to say you're wrong especially after 50 years but um that's why this is really important so um i'll give you a real practical example it wasn't until i had oxalate detoxing myself or oxalate crystals actually coming out of my eyes did i fully believe it you know even though i'd seen it so those people that do give comments that's what you've got to do. You've got to be open-minded. And sometimes you do need to experience it yourself. And I get that. So th that's my confession there, full transparency. It took that for me to really believe that actually happened. Um, but what's your take on this? Because I see you roll your eyes about, oh, this is a real big one. <laughs> yes. I think this can be one of the biggest shifts for people in in their chronic illness healing journey and one of the most important things because if you don't think you're going to get better if you believe that you're going to be sick forever if you believe that the illness you have isn't curable or isn't possible to heal from then chances are you probably won't get all the way better and the cells listen i know that sounds crazy but they do and um so for me it was huge and i think for so long like a lot of people see like the need for brain retraining all these things with the nervous system for people that are really negative and for people that just like view life from this lens of negativity and i never really felt like i was totally one of those people but once i i was overall pretty positive like i'm gonna do the best i can to to live the best possible life even though i have these illnesses and even though i have limitations 
I'm going to do everything I can to live the best life I can. And, and so that was one of the reasons why I didn't think brain retraining would work for me because I was generally pretty positive. But once I became more aware of like paying attention to my thought patterns and, um, I, I started to realize that I, I did have negative thought patterns and I, I did have, and I mean, anybody dealing with a serious illness is going to like, it's, it's inevitable, you know? And so working on those and then letting go of limiting beliefs, I think some people don't really know where to start, right? Like, how do I believe I can recover? And how do I believe healing is possible for me? And I always tell people to start with the curiosity. So say, what if I could heal? What if I could fully recover? What if that doctor was wrong? What if I can heal from this illness that he says is is lifelong and incurable? What if I could get better like this other person I saw on social media? And so just starting with that curiosity is great because beliefs don't change overnight, right? Like, especially core beliefs, beliefs that are really ingrained in you, like that takes a lot to change. And so I think just starting with the curiosity, saying I'm going to be open-minded and be willing to be wrong and um, that can be really powerful. And so for me, it was just a gradual shift. It went from like, what if I could recover? What what if I could fully heal, you know? And that got me excited. And I started to listen to like more recovery stories. And I think watching other people heal can help you heal as well. Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, limiting beliefs, like you said, they they apply to so many aspects of our life, right? Not just illness and symptoms and it's relationships it's athletics it's movement it's so many aspects of our life that limiting beliefs can have an impact on and um so it's it's been yeah really powerful for me to do belief work and to recognize what beliefs i hold and do things to shift those beliefs and that takes time but yeah for me it's been really powerful and i'd say that was a a turning point in my healing journey when i started to fully believe that i could recover not just want to because everybody that's sick wants to recover right like everybody wants to get better but do you believe you can get better those are two very different things and so that was a shift for me and i can't tell you how many people have said the same thing Yes, wanting and believing, that that's a real key difference because nobody wants to be ill, right. but if you believe you can get better. Um, I would say outside influences have been a big thing for me. You don't mind me telling a few little anecdotes in between what we're talking about. Yeah. So, so I've had this. When I was 23, I was shown a very convincing image of my hip and told I'd be in a wheelchair by 50. Here I am, uh, 60 this year, and playing five-a-side soccer every single Wednesday. So that didn't happen. When I went deaf, which incidentally was about the same time, and yes, I'm happy for comments speculating on why that happened. Also, by this time, I'd lost both my parents and a girlfriend to breast cancer. So, you know, uh, my doctor said, this isn't very scientific. I think you don't want to hear much anymore. So maybe, you know, all this constant negativity coming from the outside could have really affected me. And it did, but it made me do something because I thought, well, why would I? Why do I have to accept I'll be in a wheelchair when I'm fifty? And with the deafness, I've had not only sort of some abstract things happen, but I've had some quantifiable empirical data. So, um, like I say, I've been deaf in, since twenty three years old. I'm I'm fifty nine now and sixty in May, and I've had hearing tests with the same audiologist, same machine for many many years. When I went carnivore, he said uh, at the test after it finished. I can't, uh, what what are you doing? I think the machine's not right because you seem to have recovered a little bit of hearing. That should not happen. Not, wow, how did this happen? That should not happen. So and then I sort of said sheepishly, uh, well, I've been trying this diet. Oh, well it, can't, well, it can't be that. It can't be that. So people ha- you deal with who you could possibly influence have limiting beliefs, even with very fancy equipment, knowing, you know, that person knew me. There's no way I was lying about any of the responses. Got to the point where he actually said, I'm going to take your responses out and wire you up and see what's going on. So it's not even you saying something back or pressing a button when you hear a sound. I want to actually see it. 
even with all of those things, still did not believe that could happen. And I get that, Rachel. I get so many stories where people say, I've, I've, I've reversed lesions of my my MS, but the doctor came in really cross. This shouldn't happen. So you will get that. And, you know, so going back to sort of carnivore-centric, in a, you know, if you're, if you're eating this way and people are telling you you can't eat this way, it's not going to be good for you, that is a limiting belief they have but it shouldn't limit your beliefs. And certainly you will be frustrated when you lose some weight, you lower your blood pressure, your uh, blood glucose management is better, your insulin goes down, you feel great, you sleep better. You will find it very frustrating. So just remember that phrase that they have the limiting beliefs because they've been told. So it's like a sort of domino effect and you're going to be pushing back those dominoes and stacking them back up by saying, look, you can do something. You can do this. Yeah. Because instead it's of sorry, go ahead. No, no, you carry on. Carry on. Oh, I was just gonna say hearing that from a figure of authority, we're we're kind of taught to trust what doctors say, right? And so that can be even harder to let go of beliefs that are kind of passed down from these figures of authority that we were kind of taught to trust, right? And so that can be a, a huge barrier for people as well. And that, that's an amazing story that you told. Were you able to to gain back full hearing? No. Um, I mean, um, when I, let's full transparency here. My hearing is atrocious, but it was next to nothing. So um, it was just going down and down and down. Oh, we're hearing aids. I've got the captions on. Oh, we talk about it's just we talk about putting things into our own hands in a second actually talk about the captions i put on for myself the very very loud um speaker so i and uh, you know with zoom i can lip read so i have it, all these things all these strategies so we're going to talk about taking my healing into my own hands that's a really good example but also not relying on them uh so much so before we started Rachel, I said to Rachel, is it all right if I put captions on? Or maybe I won't, I thought. Uh, I actually said it out loud to Rachel because I want to keep trying to push my ears. All right. So it, it does lead nicely on. It wasn't scripted. We, the, the thing you said about taking healing into my own hands, you know, when we were talking about your story, with my story, both the back and the ears, was like, there must be something I can do. And weirdly, one of the things that I've discovered was a sort of, a uh, pseudo vegan diet with soy and no dairy that will clear out all my ear nose and throat stuff so this is proving how open-minded i was i did six months of absolutely hellish living um back when i was a high carb believer with soy instead of dairy and um i just got sicker and sicker and sicker and so after three months i was ready to throw in the towel but you know what it's like oh you're not doing it right you're not giving it long enough i think six months is a long time to experiment and to it's given me a headache just thinking about it um i was in a terrible state and i just said right i've tried it soy replacing dairy is about the worst thing i can do for my personal health but i kept trying these things which is you know, I've never done vegan or vegetarianism. I certainly did low fat, calorie restriction, um, lean protein, fruits, smoothies, all that, all, all that stuff. And it was uh, it was taking it into my own hands to do keto and then to do carnivore. So, how about you? You, you would you? How did you take your healing into your own hands? I think I came to a point where I just realized I'm getting sicker and sicker. And I know we discussed this in our in our last interview, but I, I got to a point where I was being recommended more neurosurgeries. So I had, you know, five brain and neurosurgeries and I was at my sickest about a year to year and a half after that. And I was being recommended more surgery and it just didn't feel right. I was so, so sick. And I thought to myself, if I am going to get better, this is not the way to do it. It's it, I'm looking back and I'm seeing that I've tried all these medications. I've tried these surgeries. I've tried these treatments that they're recommending me and I'm getting sicker. And so it just showed to me that there had to be something else. And so I decided right there that I would be open minded, that I would do anything that I could to um, to heal. And, and so I really at that point took my healing into my own hands and I 
looked into diet. I looked into nervous system work and brain training and just all these natural healing methods. And that's when I started to see progress. And I have gotten so many comments and messages like, what doctor recommended this diet for you? Or what doctor prescribed this brain retraining for you? And I say back to them, none. I made this choice on my own. I'm allowed to make choices for my own health. And I think it's so empowering to take your healing into your own hands. It can be scary, right? Like when you're really sick, it's scary because you want to have that guidance. And I think it would be nice for doctors to to guide people and for people to have somebody to guide them in their journey. But unfortunately, you know, that wasn't really an option for me at the time. And so it was either do this on your own or go this other way that has made you sicker. And so it was, it was scary to make those changes because I was like, what if I get worse, you know? And and what if this is, is not the right way? But I just decided to take it into my own hands. And and eventually that definitely became a positive thing and an empowering thing. At first it was scary, but it, it, yeah. becomes, it becomes empowering because, you know, I, I think people want the easy fix, right? People want a pill or a surgery or something to fix them. They're searching for somebody else or something else to fix them when really the most important part of healing comes from within and it comes from the choices that we're making. And so I, you know, it's the harder way, but it's, it's usually a lot more effective. Yeah. So. Nobody knows your condition as well as you. Yes. Um, you might find this interesting. Uh, I looked up a definition of the concept of taking healing into your own hands, and it said, this is a concept that emphasizes an active and empowered approach to one's healing journey. It involves adopting proactive measures, seeking out information, making informed choices, and collaborating with healthcare professionals to drive personal health and wellness outcomes. Now, the problem there is, they're not open to it many times. Uh, and I'm sorry if people don't like hearing this. Uh, I've worked in and around the healthcare profession for nearly 15 years. And my obesity and diabetes specialism means that, you know, I get referred from general practitioners. And most people that come to me have been given the wrong information. Simple, it's as simple as that. And going back to that domino effect, it's because they've been given the wrong information or the wrong guidelines. I don't think there's I don't think there's any ill intent. I don't think there's any of that. I just think it's um, misinformation coming from above, and their hands are tied. And I got I got a few comments about that expression, but it, that's true. It is true. Their hands are tied because there's huge uh, onerous um, issues with insurance and professional indemnity. So even if a doctor did think. Oh, this diabetes is out of control. Maybe try low carb. I mean, that that has loosened up recently. But you know, when I started, you couldn't you couldn't recommend low carb for someone that was on uh, the diabetic journey, for instance. And even if that person had taken it into their own hands and improved their numbers, they would get pushed back, and that still happens. So that concept is great, isn't it? I wouldn't add collaborating with healthcare professionals. I would put and try to collaborate with healthcare professionals, but don't let them put you off your path. That's personally what I would say, because it's it's important um, to you, your condition. You know your condition better. And if you're doing things that are improving it and they think that's the wrong thing to do, well, you're the one that's experiencing it. You know, it's it, to, to me, it's, you know, maybe that's yeah. not worth it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think... You know, sometimes I, I actually get messages saying th that what I'm sharing is dangerous and that I am spreading this dangerous message to people that have chronic illness. And I, I, I that just shocks me and it makes me sad for that person that's saying it because, like, honestly, if I were to continue down the Western medicine path, I don't know if I would be alive. And that's a scary thought. And I think... It just shows how our society is just so bred to believe if, that we have to listen to doctors and they're the ones who can get people better. And it's just interesting because those people that are, are saying that are the ones that are still really sick. 
and still identifying with their illness and and not getting better and it's just like i look at all those people who you know are in the chronic illness community who are getting these doctor's appointments and these treatments and medications and surgeries i don't see people getting better and honestly i i don't care how what people do to get better like if you have a surgery and that helps you i'll be cheering you on 100 percent. if you take a medication and that helps you i mean i'm not a fan of medication but I will still be happy for you. And, but I just don't see those people getting better. And I, the people I see that are getting better are the ones taking their healing into their own hands and making these changes on their own. And so it's just, it, it's crazy that we are still believe that the medical system, medications, surgeries, and all these things are what we need to do when we get sick because those people don't get better. And, it's just it's wild to me and once you once you see it you kind of can't unsee it you know yes and it is yes and i've had that remark about it's dangerous talking about health like this and even to the point you know i'm going to be very honest with you i don't know if that last section will stay in the in the video because youtube are so tight on those sort of things so if you're watching this now and there's a sudden edit um, we've taken a little bit out but you can see that probably on another platform anyway um we're going to move on to uh, nature and sunlight because this is one of my pet peeves because for 350,000 years as homo sapiens sapiens we've been outside in the sun enjoying the sun we didn't put loads of sun cream all over us um 75 percent of skin cancers are in areas that are not exposed to the sun so it, it doesn't seem to be that great to keep out of the sun but what's your what's your take on it yeah, I think I think nature is incredibly powerful for healing. And to be honest, I think one of the biggest drivers of chronic disease is our disconnection from nature, right? Like we are constantly inside. The average American spends about maybe 30 minutes on average outside or less. And we're constantly on our phones, artificial lights, fake food. We're not connected to our food anymore. Uh, we're not grounding, you know, synthetic shoes, uh, just so many aspects of our life has become so disconnected from nature. And so I think, um, it can be just so healing to spend more time in nature. And another thing, like you mentioned is, is the sunlight, right? Like we're, we're taught to fear the sun and the sun is our little life force. And it just, there's nothing like going outside in the morning and getting morning sunlight and feeling that sun on your face. Like it's so life giving and it's, it's very healing. And so, uh, yes, for me, spending time in nature has been very impactful for my healing. And actually about three years ago, we moved to a new home and we have some land and kind of live in a forested setting. And I think that was another you know aspect of my healing was you know not only getting to a, a new place just having a new place where i you know I, it's hard to heal where you got sick right so having an, a new change of scenery but also being able to spend more time in nature right and so i when i was in my really like most intense healing phase and my whole focus of my like there was a while there were pretty much the only focus of my life was healing because that's all I could focus on doing, right? And so I would go outside and I would lay on the grass, you know, with my bare feet grounding and just lay in the sun and do nothing and just lay there and do nothing but be present in nature. And that was really healing for me. And I think it's something that we're really missing in our society is connection with nature, time in nature. Like anybody who is, outdoorsy will tell you that they just feel better in nature they feel like their problems aren't as you know intense when you go outside so uh, yeah when I feel stressed I just go outside and I'm like oh maybe it isn't that bad you know and and so I I just think it's so wild that like if you like to spend time in nature that we're that's now labeled as an outdoorsy person like Aren't we meant yeah. to be nature? We're, we're a part of nature, right? <laughs> like yeah. We're, yeah. we're not meant to be trapped inside all day under artificial light. Yeah, it did. It, it, yes, I, I know. I know what you mean. It's like saying, "Look at that squirrel. That's very an, an outdoorsy squirrel, isn't it?" 
<laughs> you never say that. And I think that is, um, you know, going back to sort of beliefs and how we look at things and, uh, you know, it, it, there's just so much. Um, I'm just going to go back to just announce in the middle of this. If if there is bits cut out of this video and you want to see the full video, it will be on another platform. It'll also be on my app. So you can see the whole video unedited. But anyway, right. Trusting your body's ability to heal. Now, I always use this because people say, well, why would this get better? And I say, well, why wouldn't it? You know, if you're going to cut yourself, would your skin heal? And it's like, yes, it would. So, so you firstly bought into the concept that your body has some healing abilities. It's not just going to keep bleeding. It's going to try and stop bleeding. All right. Unless you, you're seriously unwell and there's some other issue going on. Um, if you have a bruise, that will go. You know, if you have sprain your ankle normally that recovers so um could you just get into your your take on the the body's ability to heal yeah so i definitely i and that's one of the biggest messages i want to share is that our bodies are designed to heal and it's it's interesting because like i think there are so many things about our modern world like we were just talking about that that make it difficult for our body to do what it's designed to do right to heal and so given the right state, I think healing is not only possible, but it's probable. And um, it's just like if one if one person has healed from a condition, that makes it possible. And honestly, I don't know that there's a condition I haven't heard somebody healing from. And yeah, it's uh, I, yeah, I, our bodies were designed to heal. And I think it, it goes back to the nervous system as well, right? Like when we're stuck in a, in a chronic dysregulated state, in a chronic stress state. And this is something that happens subconsciously, I might add too. It's it's not always like emotional triggers. You know, it can be physiological triggers too. It can be toxins, it can be mold, it can be all these different things, but it doesn't matter so much what the trigger is. It just matters our nervous system's capacity to handle that stressor. And so that's a lot of, what I'm doing with nervous system work is just expanding the capacity of my nervous system to handle stressors. And um, so, yes, I, I definitely believe that our bodies have an ab ability to heal, even from the worst of places. Like, I know I have a pretty dramatic story, but I'm just going to tell you, Stephen, I have heard more more crazy stories of healing than mine i've heard stories of people being on tpn and if you are you familiar with what what that is so tpn is iv nutrition so not even a feeding tube iv nutrition not even able to tolerate tube feeds to fully healing fully eating again like i've heard multiple people with feeding tubes that have been able to fully eat again and live a normal life and heal. And so healing is possible even from the worst of places. And it's easy when you're in that place to think my story is different. Like my situation is different. Maybe this other pe person can heal, but my situation is unique. And that's what I always like to share is that my story isn't unique. I'm not sharing my story to be like, hey, look at me, look what I did this amazing thing, you know? No, like, our bodies were designed to heal and my story isn't unique. Like my situation isn't unique. You can heal too. And so that's, I think something that's really important that goes back to the belief work, right? Too, like limiting beliefs, like, oh, I can't heal, you know, and shifting that belief and believing that your body can fully heal can, can be huge. Oh, uh, I muted myself there, <laughs> uh, so I, we didn't get any feedback. But yes, I actually have a client uh, success story that's coming out in a couple of weeks that went from TPN to uh, wow, full health, full health. Yeah, that does happen. Um, I, yeah, you see that we're in the same space really, and people can make amazing discoveries. And this is why I sort of play down the sort of deafness and the, you know. Uh, trouble with my hip on my back when I was in my 20s because um, some stories I hear just makes you want to weep 
it just makes you want to cry to think that they were given up on actually that's one of the things that frustrates me um by everybody and luckily the only person that didn't give up was them and they just pushed and pushed and pushed and you would imagine that everyone be sort of getting in the corridor opening doors for that person trying to get them into where they want to try to be to get better but um i constantly hear stories of obstacles and it's it's just this it's heartbreaking but it's also very inspiring because uh, well, you're inspiring, you know, because you look at your pictures, you look at the problems you were in, and you just think, wow, it would have been so easy to go, right, that's it, you know, this is the cards I've been dealt, I've just got to deal with it. And it's very easy to do that, and many people do, sadly, but hopefully your story and many others will actually uh, give them a little bit of a open the curtain let the sun in and they can wake up to it so uh that's a very cheesy segue into the next bit which is okay uh, circadian rhythms actually would you like to explain a little bit about that yeah so this is something i became interested in just kind of gradually i think sometimes when we change our diet we just become more conscious of so many different other aspects of our health and we kind of are slowly like waking up to all these different things that we can do to support our body and help um, our body to be able to heal. And so I kind of just came on to circadian rhythm just through seeing bits and pieces of information on social media and that caused me to want to research it more. And so, you know, it's it's very simple, right? Like our, our bi- biology is designed to, um, to, be in tune with our light environment. And so typically when people wake up in the morning, the first thing they look at is their phone, right? Nowadays, and that artificial light sends this false signal to our brain that it's the middle of the day. And so that kind of has a cascade of effects on our body, our hormones and everything, and um, really can affect our health, our sleep and our energy levels. And so I, I started to stop you know, picking up the phone first thing in the morning and I always go outside and I get natural light in my eyes. And um, if I happen to have to wake up before I the sun comes out, then I'll wear the, the sunlight, the orange blue light glasses until the sun comes up and then I'll go outside and get that natural light in. And just throughout the day, I will um, try to go outside and get that natural light as much as I can. Obviously with my job, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on my phone. I'm spending a lot of time on technology. And so I'll often even try to do work outside. I I do podcasts outside, but today it's really windy outside. So I didn't want to be super loud. So that's why I'm taking it inside today. But um, but yeah, it, it can help with the effects of blue light to be on your screen, whether it's your phone or your computer. And when you're outside, it can mitigate those effects. Um, and then, of course, there are the glasses that you can wear. And so doing that has been really impactful for my sleep. Um, I definitely notice that I sleep better. And um, at night, I also wear the the orange blue light glasses for a couple of hours before going to sleep and I find that really just like winds me down and if I take them off when I see the it's not just the screens that's the other thing is I always just thought it was the 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 phones and the computers and I was like okay well I could just read a book and then you know go to bed but it's the artificial lighting too and so unless you'd have you know red lights installed in your house and really the glasses are kind of the only way to block it out and so that has really helped with um, with my sleep as well, just getting as much natural light as I can and then blocking as much of the artificial light as I can. Yeah, and I think it's brought out by by science, uh, people that work night shifts. I think it's something like they, they get virtually every con- condition or illness, about 30% more, they're 30% more likely or something like that. But, but also I think we should look at nature and think, well, if you take a nocturnal animal, so for instance here, a badger does its foraging at night. You don't see a badger during the day. Now, if you saw a badger during the day, you would think there's something up, and that can't be good for the badger. So so we're obviously designed to, to – we're not nocturnal. We haven't got night vision. We're obviously designed to move moving around during the light and sleeping during the dark. I mean, to me, it's not it's not woo-woo or anything to say what you're saying. And we have artificially ruined our environment. And again, going back to animals, if you go to a zoo that has got nocturnal animals, they don't treat them the same. 
they make it as dark as possible and they use different sort of lighting so you can see these nocturnal animals and they give them an artificial uh, night time during the day and then they give them an artificial day during the night. So we know it is true with animals. We know that by just looking at animals in the wild and, and if just imagine one that should be there that isn't there or one that is there that shouldn't, how weird you would feel. You think, oh, that's, that's not right. That's a nocturnal animal. It shouldn't be out. There must be something wrong. I'm sure you'd say that because that's really odd. And yet us humans, we just break all the rules and think that's fine and we're, we're going to be, you know, fine and dandy. All right, we're going to move on. We've got, uh, I think, three more things to have a look at. Uh, neck curve correction. That was an interesting one for me. Yeah. So something that I um, had during my chronic illness journey was a lot of neck problems. I had neck instability. I had to wear a neck brace for, um, gosh, I think close to five years, four to five years. And that was, yeah, that was a huge part of my healing journey. And the animal-based diet and carnivore diet really helped to support my connective tissue and strengthen my neck, strengthen just my whole body, right? But another thing that I developed because I have a fusion, which puts my neck in a really unnatural position is I kind of had like a, a a military neck with a forward neck posture. So I have a very small jaw and this is another whole rabbit hole. I don't know if you've gone down, it, but um, when you have a, a small jaw, then you kind of have a tendency to like get the forward neck posture to try to get air. Um, so I, I did some chiropractic, treatments where I like wore neck weights and stuff like that to um, help restore my neck curve as much as we can with you know having that fusion in my neck but that was helpful for me and it was really interesting because they actually like use an ultrasound and looked at the flow of my jugular vein and like with and without the neck weight I my jugular vein just like opened up with the neck weight on. So that was just really interesting. And um, I think, you know, posture is another really important aspect of nervous system health. So like when we've got poor posture and forward neck posture, that puts a lot of strain on the vagus nerve and kind of puts you into more of the fight or flight side of the nervous system rather than the parasympathetic. So posture is is a good thing to address to to help with calming the nervous system and just healing in general as well. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, people are hunched over and, you know, if you can get people to open up, they're going to breathe better. <laughs> uh, C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive. There's, you know, the nerves coming from that part of the cervical region are really critical. And this, you know, this bending over and looking at your phone is absolutely terrible. It did. It's a terrible bit of, piece, uh, of posture. Um, moving on to this, the penultimate thing we wanted to talk about was is movement. So I think that bleeds nicely in from that because um, movement, I always say, it's really corny. Motion is lotion. You know, uh, there are there are many ways to look at this because I've worked in rehab for you know nearly fifteen years. If someone has a uh, an arm in a sling, for instance, now they for six weeks don't move that arm which is not great advice but that's what they do and then when they come to see me the the body has been amazing it's just withered that muscle away it really is, it looks terrible compared to the other arm um and that's just showing me how clever the body is because the body's decided oh this this thing this limb this expensive thing to move doesn't need the nutrients we don't need to send the amino acids to the muscles we just let it wither away this is true, by the way. So now, uh, when I first started, now they realize that you need to exercise it and stuff like that. My point being that the lack of motion or movement is detrimental. Uh, slight movement introduced, slight exercises stops that happening. So imagine if you could take that further, if you're having problems with any sort of mobility, any movement you can start to to instigate and this is where my, you know, as a personal trainer as well, I, yes, I've got a lot of hats and qualifications. Um, you know, I always say, if you want to do an intense exercise and you can only get out of a chair, then that is your intense exercise. 
train to get out of the chair then you train to walk so it isn't like um when we talk about movement we're not going to say right get the olympic rings out and start doing this and that movement is what you need to do to get you the next step so but how do you see it yeah i i think this is such an important topic and a lot of people that have serious chronic illness were before that athletes you know i was an athlete before i got really sick and a lot of people that become really sick had that really high achiever mindset and and so i think it's really difficult for people to realize that they have to start in a different place in a very different place like especially if you're bed bound like you're not going to be able to go do your ab workout at first that you did before you got sick and so many people with chronic illness push it too far because in their in their mind the only way to exercise is to do what they used to do and so pacing yourself is really hard when you you just you want something bigger and you don't want to you want it to come right away right like and it's not going to so you have to really pace yourself with that and i think um this can be a triggering topic for a lot of people with serious chronic illness because like well i can't do that you know but you can move and even if your exercise is just raising your arms in bed like start there and just very gradually work up and and to a place where you know you are not because you can overexercise, right? You can do damage. And so when you're really sick, you have to go slow. You have to pace yourself. And that's something that I definitely struggled with. Um, my husband was really helpful with that, like helping me to kind of develop exercises and things that like were in my window of tolerance at time. And as my window of tolerance increased, I, I increased those exercises and and pacing myself was was the best way to go about it. And so um, it's really hard to hear that, like when if you're really sick, when you're, oh, well, I can't even walk, right? Like, and, it's, and it's hard for people to be like, well, you need to move more, you know? And so I think it's, it's the way that you approach it and say, you need to meet that person where they're at and say, your exercise is just, going to be small and um you're gonna widen that tolerance over time and you know in a year or two years like you can make a lot of progress if you do it in the right way and so i think for me uh, you know tying back into diet i had that severe chronic fatigue where i would have those crashes from overdoing it where i would just not be able to look at light or listen to sound or basically move it all you know like in bed and diet really helped with that to where like when I overdid it, it wasn't as severe. And so I think combining those two things can be really powerful. And yeah, mo movement is, is definitely medicine, but you have to start where you're at. Yeah, definitely. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And that, that is true as well. There's lots of little phrases I use in rehab. Like I say, um, Motion is lotion is one of my favorite ones. I also think patience. Um, you are a patient, but you've got to be patient. So if you have a critical illness and you start on a road of trying to turn it around, unless it's an accident, a traumatic event, you know, a sudden traumatic event, but if it's something that's grown over time, you have to think to yourself, well, it's not going to be three weeks when I'm back to normal. It's taken 15 years for my body to be like this. So, you know, I've got to be patient. And you um, don't want to tie yourself up for disappointment. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, last thing was listening to recovery stories and stepping back from illness support groups, uh, which is really interesting because, um, well, let's hear what you've got to say on that. That's, that's what yeah, I'm so Actually, believe it or not, before I started sharing, you know, my carnivore and then brain retraining recovery story, I had a different account that I shared my chronic illness story. And I, I did it, you know, with a, an aspect of hope and faith and all these things. But all the people I followed on there were doing the same things I was doing, desperately researching their symptoms. They were trying to find answers from doctors, trying to find treatments, trying to find something else an external source that was going to fix them. And I had to step away from that. I had to step away from that completely. I couldn't even look. And, and even to this day, like I, 
I, I really can't go back on that account because all I see is people in hospital gowns and getting surgeries and getting ports and feeding tubes and all these things that just are triggering for me after all I went through. And so getting out of that environment was really healing for me. And it was a necessary step. And so many people that have healed from serious chronic illness, you know, say the same thing. And and chronic illness support groups are meant to help and encourage people, right? But I think they can often be such a toxic environment because all people are connecting on is illness and symptoms. And it's this constant negativity where people are complaining and talking about symptoms and this desperation of searching for answers and doctors and treatments and all the focus is on illness. And it's just, it's not healthy. It it reinforces that neural pathway of I'm sick, I'm sick. And just seeing other people being sick, I think so much exposure to that can make you sicker. And it's just, for me, when I, I, I started a new account and I was like, okay, I'm starting a new account. This is going to be my healing journey. And I'm going to follow people that believe they can heal. I'm going to follow people that are healing. I'm going to listen to recovery stories because there are so many out there. It's interesting. I saw a comment on our last video. Somebody like, I'd never heard of somebody recovering from chronic fatigue syndrome. And I was like, I've heard hundreds, maybe even thousands of stories of people recovering, like literally just typing in YouTube chronic fatigue syndrome recovery story and people don't stay around in those chronic illness Facebook support groups when they get better like because it's not a healthy environment right and so that was definitely a powerful thing for me it was just shifting my focus to healing and associating more with people who were more in line with what I was doing and that was hard because I made a lot of really great friendships and met a lot of great people. Like those people are great people. It's not the people, it's the environment, right? So it's it's normal to be desperate and and um, hopeless and all these things when you're experiencing severe chronic illness, but that's not a healing environment. It's not conducive to healing. And so stepping away from that is definitely important. Absolutely. Rachel, thank you so much. That has been a very interesting and enthralling hour thank you <laughs> i enjoyed it thank you so much for having me back